everyone eats. So everyone's interested in food. I mean, you know, you, you eat, you put it in your body every day, and as soon as you start not taking it for granted, then it becomes a very, very interesting subject because it spreads back. I think the question of class is pretty much probably the most important question to address around foodism. I would say that the identifying of groups of people from um, elite classes and from up middle class and, and um, people from who are in higher socioeconomic brackets uh, with an interest in the foodie movement doesn't diminish the very strong interest in food that exists throughout society. Um, and so the question then becomes, who has access to alternatives in what they eat and what they put inside their bodies and what's available within their community and for their families, and who doesn't and why? And for most foodies, self-identified foodies, but not all, um, for many of them, it, it's a choice. Whereas for a lot of people, there isn't a choice. And so I think foodism brings up class issues because who gets included and excluded from those events has a lot to do with things like, you know, who's not in the room? Why aren't they there? Um, what prevents them? Uh, even when people have great consciousness, what prevents them? What are the circumstances of their lives? So I'm kind of, you know, who has the time? Who's working three minimum wage jobs and who's living on a trust fund makes a big difference about whether you can participate in the foodie movement. If that foodie movement is focused upon aspects which are somehow disconnected from those kinds of social and class realities. Uh, and then that brings us out that you know, the problems aren't just about food. Problems are much bigger. And so we need to be thinking about problems in a whole series of different parts of our world if we want to truly get, say, access to good food to the vast majority of people. I was originally born in Ghana and I lived there till I was 13 and I moved to East New York which is mostly um, um, it, black people live in East New York, African American, Asian, like West Indians, Africans and it was a new like experience especially in terms of food where I didn't have my traditional food which was fine but I realized quickly realized that the food that I was eating it wasn't really healthy for me at all and um like I my I quickly started gaining weight. I ate a lot of potato chips and in East New York we have a lot of crown fried chicken Chinese places and what else do we have? I think that's all the food we have access to actually. And um, so you have no choice but to eat what you have right there. Throughout American history, there's never ever been a problem that we lacked enough food. The problem is we've lacked enough income for poor people to be able to buy food. Access to nutritious, affordable food, even in the height of the Great Depression, even with the Dust Bowl, there was tremendous agricultural overproduction in America, but tremendous hunger because people didn't have enough money for food.
Uh, sometimes people in the elites, and I include people who consider themselves progressive as well as people who consider themselves conservative, falsely believe that the problem is low-income people are just irresponsible. Uh, there. They don't grow all their food themselves and cook it all from scratch uh, very slowly. That's an incredibly class-biased uh, notion. Uh, Low-income people just don't have the time to grow their own food and cook every meal from scratch, even if they had the weather conditions to do it, even if they had the facilities to do it. Now, the minimum wage in this country is a little over thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars a year for full-time work. Many people pay far more than that for rent. Uh, so if you're paying more in rent than you're earning, there's no shock that you're not going to have enough money for food. Um, in, among low-income families with children, forty percent say that they have had to forego food purchases to pay their rent. Thirty mm -hmm. percent say they've had to forego their food purchases to pay their utilities. And when they're asked if they've had to buy less healthy food to save money, 30% say yes. So the last thing that you worry about is food. And if you go to the grocery store and you see the cheapest pack of chicken, you're gonna buy that obviously because that's what you can afford at the moment. So you don't think about your choices every day. In the moment, you don't really care because if you, um, you can't afford to care, if you start caring and you, do, you can't afford the food that you want, what's the point, you know? Overall, and in general terms, I would say local's a good thing. Because the quality's better, in the sense that it's gonna, you're going to get fresher things that have accountability. You're going to know who, who, how they're grown, conditions of the vegetables, the animals, what have you. Um, so health reasons, the best quality. Um, and etc. So all, for all those reasons, I can't think of a reason not to actually. That, that's why we do it so strictly, um, because there's no reason not to buy. You're just cheating yourself in essence, you know. Versus uh, the supermarket, it's definitely a little more expensive. It's more of a conscious thing rather than a money thing. You know, I'm not doing it for money. I'm not thinking about. Um, the, the dollar, it's not about the dollar sign here, it's more about the experience, the quality of life, and you can't really put a price on that. So, of course money comes into it, but you know, as you see here at the market, you, you get your price and you pay. I don't think too much about that. So, I think the, mo the movement is really missing the people who are really suffering from this movement. It excludes certain people who have less privilege or certain race, but nobody wants to talk about that, you know? So, the, yeah, the movement is like, ideally, it's for some people only. Whole Foods, not in Brooklyn. There's no Whole Foods in Brooklyn because they're, they're afraid people won't eat it, which is a lie people will, if you tell them. They just don't think their market is there. Who's that? What market is for Whole Foods exactly? It's that like young white people. Oh, that, like that's not a movement. A movement does not work that way. Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, all that, very exclusive stores. 
very um yeah food stores very exclusive like it's catered to young white people and and it's like a trend or a hip thing food is not like that food is not a trend healthy food should be available to everyone yeah we, we need to start getting that, that dialogue going food is a human right it is a human right actually just like water is a human right in the late 1970s we almost entirely ended hunger in america i'm gonna repeat that too in the late 1970s we almost entirely ended hunger in america how we had an economy of living wage jobs with pensions and benefits and we did not have the mass levels of working poor that we have today. The good news is, the reason this happened in the 1970s is we built a social movement that pressured our elected officials to do something serious about it. Richard Nixon ran for president in 1968, denying hunger was a problem. He said, oh, my opponents are just making this up to embarrass me. Within a year, Richard Nixon held the first, and to this day only, White House conference on hunger that led to very significant improvements in the safety net programs. It didn't happen because overnight Richard Nixon became a fun, loving, you know, caring about poor people and kind of got I wrote a book a few years ago on hunger in America and the subhead of my book called Richard Nixon's Beef, Despot, Crook, uh, and one of history's best hunger fighters. He did it because he was pressured by the social moments that were built up. So the good news, and we'll talk about that throughout the day, you'll hear from some of our better elected officials here, that you can do something without the social movement. The more I do what I'm doing, the more change there is in the world. If I stop doing it, then I'm one less person. So I see this, the more momentum, so if you're doing it, if you practice it, then you're another person practicing it. And if somebody else practices it, then there's another person. And all of a sudden, if everybody's practicing it, then you have change. But sitting around pointing the finger and telling, this needs to happen here, and that needs to happen there, but not practicing it, you're not going to have change. To me, it's on the individual level, 100%. Yeah, that movement needs to be taken a, for, um, a step further, and people who are starting these all these food movements also need to realize that if, if you tell people what they're supposed to be eating, you're supposed to what not to eat. You also have to tell them what they can eat, and you have to provide that for them too. Because it's like just like smoking. If you eat, um, ingest the wrong thing, eventually it's gonna catch up to you, and it's yeah. It's a hard conversation to have because yeah. it's so wrong to me. So to address the big paradox in our society, which is you know, how we are in, within the world, we have you know, a billion hungry and a billion who are obese, um, while we have the greatest amount of food being produced ever on the planet. Um, well, th those are big structural issues. To me, the question within the foodie movement is to what degree can the growing awareness around food translate into broader movements and coalitions with other sectors of society, other groups and organizations to bring about longer term progressive change towards a food system that will benefit everyone. That would be where I see the real potential and what I'm excited about in the politics of the food movement and in terms of foodism. We have to help people understand there is a better way and that's what today is about, the better way. You can take it in your hands to do something more serious about this. You can engage with your policymakers to do something serious about this. You can volunteer to help all these working families who are eligible for government benefits, not getting them to get them. Think not only Act not only with your heart, act with your head.